Um, thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be back here in the land of my grandfathers. Um, they were migrants. They migrated <coughs> from Ireland to Great Britain and uh, so that I could never forget my heritage. They called me Nula Kathleen Mary Treza. <laughs> Try telling anyone you're not Irish with a name like that. But the other great thing, of course, about coming here is that people spell it properly. It's great. Um, after many years of being misspelled. It's a great pleasure to be back here, and it's a wonderful uh, follow-on to the really excellent conference that ECRE organized in Kalini uh, shortly before Christmas on the Dublin Regulation. And I'm very sorry that I'm afraid we are going to have to talk, unfortunately, about the Dublin regulation a bit more, though we really don't want to talk about it anymore because it's just becoming very tedious. Um, but before I talk about that, I would just like to make a personal uh, expression of gratitude because I have worked for 20 odd years both with the Refugee Council when it was first set up, with the Irish Centre for European Law when it was first set up, and with ECRE when it was first set up. And I can say that uh, working with these three organisations has been a pure pleasure and a great uh, privilege to work with three institutions who work harmoniously together to try and promote and protect uh, the compliance with European law in the fields which affect some of the most vulnerable people in Europe. So it's a double pleasure to be here today. I'm going to start off uh, by some very general remarks about some general principles of European law that I think are applicable to our field and particularly applicable to vulnerable groups, which is uh, what I'm supposed to be talking about this morning. I don't promise that I will stick rigidly to the uh, brief, but I will try not to stray from it too far. Um, I want to talk about some principles. I want to talk about uh, how the asylum aki has expressly recognized the needs of vulnerable groups. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the case law of the European Court of Justice, as well as the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but I want to start off with two principles which have not so far been mentioned here today. We've talked a lot about the Charter, we've talked about dignity, and we've talked about uh, integrity, and we've talked about the right to asylum, and we've talked about the vexed question of when are we implementing or not implementing EU law, but we haven't talked about the one great gift the Charter has given us. And if it was actually complied with, the other problems would 90% evaporate. It is the right to good administration in Article 41. The right to good administration. That means every single person whose situation is in some way regulated by EU law has the right to expect that the public authorities who are involved in the administration of that law both in assessments, in decision-making, in provi direct provision, in uh, judicial conduct, judicial proceedings. It all has to be done efficiently, expeditiously, and fairly. And if we stop for a couple of minutes and think about the cases that we deal with in our daily lives, whether as decision makers or judicial decision makers or as lawyers or as NGOs, I can guarantee 
that there isn't one that you will think of in your heads now where it wouldn't have happened better or the problems probably wouldn't have occurred at all if there had been good administration. And now that we have that tool in the Charter, we have to use it and we mustn't let uh, national administrations forget that they have a legal obligation to be what is called in the UK fit for purpose. And that's incredibly important. And it's actually more important than Article 47 and the right to an effective remedy, because if we had good administration, most of the time we wouldn't need effective remedies. We would have proper, efficient, fair decision-making and provision in the beginning. And of course, if you are a member of one of the vulnerable groups we're going to be talking about this morning, it's even more important that you are dealt with by an administration that performs according to its legal obligations under Article 41 of the Charter. My second general point is about discrimination. Everybody knows that you mustn't discriminate against people on any of the well-rehearsed prohibited grounds. <laughs> what people often tend to forget is the salient judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in a case called Thlemenos against Greece many years ago now. And the Slimenos case had got nothing to do with asylum. It was about a Jehovah's Witness who was uh, penalized, criminalized for failing to do his military service in Greece. And then when he took the Greek national accountancy exams and came top, uh, he wasn't allowed to practice as an accountant because he had a criminal conviction. And the criminal conviction was matched to his conscientious objection to military service. And he took his case to Strasbourg. Uh, and the case is very important because it said the prohibition on discrimination not only means that national authorities must not discriminate against people by treating them differently when they should be treated the same. What Slimenos importantly says is that where people should be treated differently, they suffer discrimination if you treat them the same. So the people we are concerned with in this session this morning, the vulnerable groups, are entitled under the principle in Slimenos to have different treatment, treatment that takes into account the differences that they have from other asylum seekers who may be less vulnerable than they are. So the members of vulnerable groups have a, an essentially non-discrimination right to be treated differently because their needs are different. That's the second point. And the third point is one which we have alluded to from time to time already this morning uh, and yesterday, which is Article 1 of the Charter, which is the right to dignity. And it follows so inevitably from the uh, first two points that I've made, the right to good administration and the right to be treated differently if your needs are different, uh, that you must at all times in any area regulated by EU law be treated with dignity and not only be treated with dignity but the systems that are in place to implement the relevant provisions of EU law must ensure the dignity of all individuals including those who come from most vulnerable groups. So those are the three key underlying principles that we want to talk about. 
Now, we know that the old asylum key and the new asylum key uh, all identify various groups of people who are uh, deserving of and entitled to uh, pre preferential treatment or different treatment, not necessarily preferential. Article 17 of the old Reception Conditions Directive talks about minors, disabled persons, elderly persons. When you get to my age, you're glad you get included. Pregnant women, I've done that. Uh, single parents with minor children, mercifully never had to do that. Uh, persons subjected to torture, rape, or other serious forms of psychological, physical, or sexual violence. So those are squarely in Article 17 of the Reception Conditions Directive as requiring special consideration. Article 21 of the Recast Reception Conditions Directive uh, talks, adds in to that list unaccompanied minors, disabled, elderly, pregnant, single parents, etc. But in, 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 or in addition to that uh, pre-existing group, we have now victims of trafficking, persons with serious illnesses, and persons with mental disorders, as, we, as well as uh, people who have been subjected to the uh, forms of ill treatment like rape and torture, but also uh, specifically victims of female genital mutilation. And the Asylum Procedures Directive, uh, in its preamble at Recital 29, also talks about uh, the vulnerable people and the groups. And we have to look at the whole asylum key, despite its patchwork application, despite J Denmark not being opted in, except to Dublin, despite the uh, variable geometry of uh, the UK and Ireland, we have to look at the common asylum system as a whole and we have to look at the Asylum Procedures Directive and its implementation and the Qualification Directive and its implementation and the Reception Conditions Directive and its implementation and we have to look at those uh, as a tessellated group of instruments, each one of them depends on the proper functioning of the other instruments. And I would throw out a uh, little remark here, as we're sitting here in the country that didn't opt in either to the reception conditions directive first time round or second time round, as was mentioned again this morning. Uh, this does not get Ireland off the hook in relation to the implementation of the common European asylum system in respect of the right to dignity and in respect of the right not to be, to be free from discrimination, that is to have a system which ensures that, ensures that you are treated differently if you need different treatment and the right to good administration. Now, the right to good administration in EU law, as many of the more expert people in this room than I will know well, is uh, not just about answering letters promptly and not having your phone off the hook whenever anybody wants to ring you up. It's about what is called in EU law as a principal effective legal protection which is different from effective judicial protection, which is what we get in Article 47. And it ensures, and this is where you have to go back and read all the milk quota and motor insurance bureau cases and Hercules chemicals and all those other cases to find out what the EU means by the right to good administration. And it's very important that all the people who are in uh, asylum determination procedures have the right to good administration which enshrines and respects the right to dignity irrespective of whether the state concerned has chosen to opt in or not opt in to the reception conditions directive it doesn't mean that that state doesn't have any obligations in terms of direct provision 
not just as a matter of national law, but as a matter of EU law. Controversial point, but, you know, I like making controversial points. Um, other uh, efforts have been made, and UNHCR has done a very comprehensive survey of uh, the rights and needs of vulnerable asylum seekers in a number of countries, which I commend to everybody who hasn't yet read it. It's very thorough, and it looks at uh, what happens in various member states of the EU, and it looks at what ought to happen and how identification and assessment is made. But I think the important thing, and this comes back to the right to good administration, is that identifying the needs of the vulnerable is something which must happen at the very first stage at which an individual comes up against the authorities when indicating that he or she wishes to claim international protection. And that's clearly set out in the recast uh, reception conditions directive and the pr procedures directive. There must be early identification of the needs of vulnerable groups and ongoing monitoring. And the reception conditions directive in Article 22, referring back to Article 21, talks about the assessment of special needs for asylum seekers and an indication recorded on the file of the nature of those needs and that this has to be done within a reasonable time. Eh, how long is a piece of string? But a reasonable time uh, has to be prompt, given the urgency that many people with uh, special needs have, uh, but it also has to be monitored and assessed and identified if they become apparent, not at the very beginning of the procedure, but at a later stage. So that's all enshrined in the law. But uh, those special needs have to be attended to for the duration of the procedure and there must be appropriate monitoring here. We're back to the right to good administration. There must be appropriate monitoring to make sure that the needs, that there's a legal obligation to identify and to indicate are being uh, properly uh, served throughout the whole of the procedure. And the uh, Recast Asylum Procedures Directive at uh, Paragraph, um, recital 29 of its preamble talks about the identification of the needs of people who belong to vulnerable groups before the first instance decision. Uh, and Article 24 mystically, and I don't know where, where's Lars gone? He was here a minute ago, there, um, who uh, in, in his wonderful phrase, going back to his shady past, um, <laughs> They expose to us some of the uh, problems that occur when these uh, things are being thrashed out. I always love that remark about um, treaties and international agreements that Bismarck made, which I'm sure you all know, which is that treaties are like sausages. They're good things when you've got them, but you don't want to watch them being made. Um, <laughs> there is a provision which says that uh, all these administrative requirements do not need to take the form of an administrative procedure. So when that one comes up before you, I'm sure you'll have fun deciding how an administrative requirement cannot take the form of an administrative procedure. So I'm glad that you're sitting in Luxembourg and not me. Um, I want to move on now briefly just to talk about the vulnerable groups, I've, I've mentioned the vulnerable groups that have been identified in the CEAS uh, legislation, and I want to talk about some of the vulnerable groups who have been identified as vulnerable groups in, by the Strasbourg Court, not necessarily in uh, cases anything to do with asylum, but I think it's quite important for us to be aware when we are uh, striving towards the recognition of the rights which are enshrined in these instruments, uh, and particularly when we're looking at Articles 51, 52 and 53 of the Charter, to look at 
those groups that the Strasbourg Court has identified expressly as being particularly vulnerable. Uh, in 2011, the case of Kyutin <coughs> against Russia made it clear that uh, people who were HIV positive uh, constituted a vulnerable group. And uh, Kyutin, the court, in Kyutin, the court held not only have we, do we explicitly recognize that people who are HIV positive are protected as a distinct group against discrimination in relation to their fundamental rights, but it's also recognized that they are a vulnerable group and that any uh, implementation of their rights attracts a higher degree of scrutiny on the part of the reviewing court, and in particular the uh, European court. And remember, discrimination has both positive and negative aspects. Um, in Gorilov and Russia, the court found that anybody who is in detention is to be classified as a person who forms a vulnerable group. In Hedrova and Slovakia, um, and I will send this list to, it's something we attached to the intervention we did in Tarakel, but I'll send this list to, to, to Sue and it can be distributed to anybody who wants it. Um, the court in Hedrova and Slovakia said that Slovakia had a duty to protect the physical and psychological integrity of individuals who were the vulnerable victims of domestic violence. So we add victims of domestic violence into our group. Uh, in BS and Spain, the court noted the special vulnerability that was inherent in a woman's situation as an African woman working as a prostitute in Spain. Uh, in a whole raft of cases, the court has recognized the particular uh, vulnerability of Roma as a specific group because they are a specific disadvantaged and vulnerable minority and therefore require special protection. This was also the case uh, that was articulated <coughs> in uh, Winterstein and France. Um, in Rupa, and Romania, I'm sorry, this is a long catalogue, but I think it's quite useful to add on to the ones that are listed in the directives. A person suffering from psychological disorders and was recognised as having second degree disability on this count, uh, that it was essential that proper provision was made by the administration, good administration, uh, to take into account her vulnerable psychological uh, state and uh, provide appropriate psychological and psych psychiatric therapy for her state. In Renault and France, there was a man suffering from acute psychotic disorders and of course as we know many uh, asylum seekers suffer from very serious psychological trauma. The court reiterated that the vulnerability of mentally ill people called for special protection and was shocked by the fact that despite the applicant's first suicide attempt and a prima facie diagnosis of his mental condition, it did not appear that there had ever been any proper discussion about whether he should be admitted for uh, treatment in a mental uh, care hospital. Uh, the same true of B and Romania and so on. So we have a great long list of people whom the European Court of Human Rights has already classified as members of vulnerable groups. And it's important that when we are looking at whether or not people can be considered as vulnerable for inclusion in the enhanced protection of the directives, that they, uh, we should look not just at the bare words that are used in the directives, but some kind of buttressing uh, for those bare words by the jurisprudence of the court. 
and the vulnerability that has been expressly identified. Um, we are all familiar, of course, with uh, the special vulnerability of children, and in particular of unaccompanied minors and separated children. Um, I'm not going to say an awful lot about that, because, uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, mm -hmm. I have uh, said that as I don't know nearly as much about this as Nadine, who's sitting over there, she's going to ask a question, which is actually going to be a contribution when I finish speaking, where she will share some of her rich expertise on uh, children, um, if you are prepared to indulge that request of mine. Uh, but we did, of course, take the case of MABT and DA to the uh, Court of Justice in Luxembourg, um, where we were again looking at the dreaded Dublin regulation, where it seemed rather perverse that one paragraph of a particular article of the Dublin regulation said you had to take children's best interests into account, but the second paragraph didn't actually say best interests of children, so the UK government argued that it wasn't necessary to take the best interests of children into account. Sometimes you wonder why people argue things like that. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to tell you that the Court of Justice in Luxembourg did the right thing on that occasion. And finally, I want to uh, conclude by saying that I think when we are looking at uh, the situation of vulnerable people, including in particular um, families and children, we need to look outside the jurisprudence on the asylum key and the jurisprudence of refugee law and draw parallels from other areas, not just the milk quotas and the motor insurance and Hercules chemicals if we're arguing an EU law point, but within the Strasbourg uh, arena, we can also look at other important issues, and particularly in relation to uh, the Dublin regulation. And I'm going to conclude by reading uh, a paragraph from a case called Exxon Latvia, which was decided just before Christmas. This was not a case about a Dublin transfer. It was a case about a Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. And what the court said, and we would argue that it applies mutatis mutandis to any proposed uh, Dublin transfer involving children, the court considers that the Convention imposes on domestic authorities a particular procedural obligation in this respect. When assessing an application for a child's return, the courts must not only consider arguable allegations of a grave risk for the child in the event of the return being carried out, but must also make a ruling giving specific reasons in the light of the circumstances of the case. Both the refusal to take account of objections to return and insufficient reasoning in the ruling dismissing such objections would be contrary to the requirements of the European Convention. Due consideration of such allegations demonstrated by reasoning of the domestic courts, and this is the important bit, that is not automatic or stereotyped, but sufficiently detailed in the light of the exceptions to return, which must be interpreted strictly. This will also enable the European court, whose task is not to take the place of national courts, to carry out the European supervision entrusted to it. Thank you for listening. I haven't gone through all the things that you probably thought I was going to go through, because I think most people in this room know all of them, but I think it's important to put the vulnerable people uh, in the context of the whole legal picture within which we work. And I close just by reminding you all of what was said in MSS, which is that uh, all asylum seekers are vulnerable. It's just some asylum seekers are more vulnerable than others. And as I go to sit down, can you all close your eyes and reconstruct in your heads the pictures
of those people on little boats in the Mediterranean and tell me that you don't think any of them are vulnerable. Thank you.